right, is it time? Yeah, sure. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Um, I am so happy that you were joining us this evening. This is really a fantastic book, and you are in for a treat. This is Left Bank Books presents Turkish American writer and a recipient of the O. Henry Prize, Kanan Orhan, who will discuss the fiercely imaginative debut story collection by a startle a startling talent who can seemingly do anything. And that was a quote by Anthony Mara, who is incredible and has appeared here. Uh, the book is called I Am My Country. Uh, Left Bank Books. Uh, we host over 200 author events per year. We are so happy that you are here. It is with your support that we were able to do such events. I am the event coordinator, so I help set up the events with our fantastic team, including Amber and Elena. Uh, we are able to do that with your support. When you buy books from Left Bank Books, not only do you support the event series, but you also are putting money back into the local economy. You are keeping the parks free, the streets paved, the libraries funded, uh, water main, uh, since water main breaks is in the news right now, and since I barely have any water pressure at home, uh, let's support the local economy so that I can take a shower tomorrow. Uh, so your money goes in and does all of that. So I really do thank you for supporting local, for supporting Love Big Books as we celebrate 54 years this summer. Um, like I said, I am Shane Mullen. Tonight, I get the extreme pleasure of being in conversation with Kanan. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book, and then I will introduce <laughs> A fiercely imaginative debut story collection by a startling talent who can seemingly do anything explores the lives of ordinary people in Turkey to reveal how even individual acts of resistance have extraordinary re repercussions. The Atlantic says, I Am My Country employs many different literary styles and voices to dazzling effect. Spanning decades and landscapes, from the forests along the Black Sea to the streets of Istanbul, Kanan Orhan's Playful stories conjure dreamlike worlds of talking animals, flying houses, and omniscient prayer callers to examine humanity's unfaltering pursuit of hope in even the darkest circumstances. A determined florist trains a neighborhood stray dog to blow up a corrupt president. A garbage collector finds banned instruments and later musicians in the trash and takes them home to form a clandestine orchestra in her attic. A smuggler risks his life to bring a young woman claiming to be pregnant via immaculate conception across the border with Syria. A poor cage maker tries to use his ability to talk to birds to woo his childhood love just before the 1955 Istanbul pogrom. These characters are united by a desperate yearning to break free from the volatile realities they face. Rising authoritarianism, cultural and political turmoil, and staggering violence. Ranging from the absurd to the tenderhearted, the stories in I Am My Country illuminate the constant force amid one's country, it one's, one country's history of rampant oppression and revolutionary progress, the impulse to survive. I did read uh, Anthony Mara, who is brilliant and fantastic. Uh, but another blurb from Andrew Sean Greer, who is also brilliant and fantastic, says, Orhan's talents are immense, and the full glory of his storytelling is on display. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> There's a lot of praise for this book, really y'all. Nice. <laughs> really nice. Uh, and it's very well deserved. I'm going to ask about that in a second. <clears throat> uh, Kanan Orhan is a Turkish-American writer and a recipient of the O. Henry Prize. His stories have appeared in the Paris Review, Massachusetts Review, Prairie Schooner, The Common, and elsewhere, and have been anthologized in the Best American Short Stories. Orhan, Orhan received his MFA from Emerson College and lives in Kansas City. I Am My Country is his first book. Without further ado, would you please help me in welcoming the incredible Kanan Orhan. Uh, all right, so welcome. Thank you for coming over uh, from Kansas City, where I was uh, over the weekend. <laughs> so really fantastic. Uh, I want to start by asking you about 
the characters. So each point of view that you have is very, very unique and almost immediately striking when you start the story of like, this is absolutely the character that I want to hear from. At what point in your writing or have you ever been like writing along and then been like, no, this character, this is now the one that has to be the point of view. So I want to know what your inspiration is for finding that point of view character. Uh, first, thanks so much for having me here. I'm very excited. I love both my books. Uh, but uh, a fantastic question, one I really like to answer um, is questions about characters. Uh, because for me, it, it's kind of this weird, fun thing where I'm constantly hearing voices. Um, and I get to admit that with being institutionalized. Uh, but every story for me, uh, except for Soma, I will say, they all kind of start from some strong voice, just saying a line over and over and over again at me, uh, more than to me. Uh, but it's uh, it's never been so much that this story then shifts and I have to pick a different character. It's always been the story evolves around a character. For example, in the Muezzin, I knew right away person telling the story, even though the story was going to be about somebody else. I knew it was kind of going to be this voyeuristic uh, prayer caller who's up in his little spire constantly watching everybody. Um, similar with the Bayola Municipality Waste Management Orchestra. Um, it just kind of hit me out of the blue that this woman's voice kept saying like, oh, I've got to pick this old man out of the trash. And then an old man kept saying over and over, I'm the trash today, you better bend with your knees. Uh, so it's it's kind of a weird uh, place to start. I've, I've learned in, in talking to some other authors who really start with images or, or kind of plot ideas or, or a general theme. Uh, I really trust my obsessions, my kind of internal uh, compass, I guess, for lack of a better word, to flesh out a story around some sort of strong character's voice. Because for me, so much of the magic of literature is engaging with a narrator. And a narrator is sometimes a character in the story, sometimes a character outside of the story. I think if it's a weak story, it's not really a character, it's just a narrator. But if you know who the narrator is and you can tell, like, should I ask them to coffee or <clears throat> kick them out of my house, that's always a little bit more moving for me. That's where stories become fun. Uh, so several of these stories have been published previously. Uh, all of them? Or? Almost all of them. Almost all of them. Um, so I'm wondering, I've actually never asked this question before, what is the process? Like, do you get to go back and revise again? Do you get to, like, kind of play around with the story again? Or is it just like, okay, someone else played with this, we're done, it's perfect. <laughs> All of these stories are very far from perfect. <laughs> um, but, no, it was, a, it was an eye-opening experience um, to kind of work with essentially nine or, or more editors uh, because some of them were selected for anthologies as well so i'm working with not only the magazine editors who decided to publish the story but also um, then the anthology editors and then finally my book editor um, and before my book editor my agent it was we kind of try to meld these into a cohesive although that was pretty easy since they were all about turkey um yeah but uh no it was it was kind of I don't know what I was expecting, so I probably would have been surprised either way. But I was like, oh, Soma appeared this way and was selected for an O'Henry. And then they made a few adjustments, but that's how it was, and so that's probably how it would be. But we actually made, you know, not some insignificant amount of edits. Some others, though, were heavily edited um, for the better. I'm, I'm very thankful for a lot of the work that went into, besides me, that went into this book um, because it's, it's very difficult, I think, when you you write a bunch of stories and you try to get them published, and the industry is incredibly slow. So you know, this book took ten years, although I wrote most of these stories in about a year and a half. Um, and so I had to go. I had to like essentially time travel to a previous self um, and try to get into that head and what these stories were supposed to be um, as we started editing. And you know, my editor, I think, gives me a little too much credit because she's just like, oh, count on, you wrote this story, and it's really good. Just, you know, get back to that and make a couple edits. I'm like, wow, I've actually gotten worse as a writer, so I don't think this is possible. Uh, but 
but it's it's been strange, um, and all these stories are better uh, with every editor that's come to them. There's never been a moment where I think a story has really floundered or failed because of an editor's touch, and I'm very thankful for that. But for the most part, the literary world, like short story world, they're very generous editors. Um, so, short story authors sometimes that's all they do, right? and then you get like George Saunders, who, like ten books later, will do an award-winning novel. Right. Do you plan to continue writing short stories? Do you have like uh, non-fiction narrative in you? Do you have like a novel like, in the works? Yeah, I um, I would have started with just saying, oh, novel for sure, uh, because I'm I am I'm in the middle of one uh, that's really strange, kind of a, a 16th century petty bureaucrat in the Ottoman Empire gets sent to Italy to track down a missing treasure um, and rumors of a lost regiment from a failed invasion 100 years ago. Yeah, this is a horrible elevator pitch. That's probably why. <laughs> um, but I promise it's interesting. Um, no, but I recently wrote um, just kind of in a whirlwind after you know finishing all the editing work for this book, the book's done, it's coming out, getting very close to publication date, and I just, that voice, some other voice, even though I was working on a novel, some other voice kind of interceded, so I wrote a story um, about a, a woman who finds out her bathroom renovation is actually a salivary prison in Istanbul, so she has a prison now in her bathroom instead of a shower with two heads. Um, but it, yeah, so it's a little weird, um, but that was picked up by The Atlantic, and I I really hope that this novel goes somewhere, and I really believe in it, and I'm having a lot of fun with it, but it is so enticing to go to short stories. They're incredibly rewarding, I find. In a, in a field that generally a pat in the back is all the kind of accolade you'll get for a really, really long time, and then it all happens at once. Um, short story publications, at least, you know, every once in a while, you'll be like, oh, this feels good. Um, I know that we can Several of you might be more familiar uh, with Turkey than others, but you could go out there and read a Wikipedia article, read some news articles. But I'm curious what your Turkey is and what we need to understand about your Turkish experience to help like enrich our reading of the book. That's a tough one, uh, just because I feel like it could take an hour to answer that question. Um, my turkey is, is um, it's really nice, um, and it's an incredibly privileged turkey because uh, I'm half Turkish, and a lot of my mother's family uh, is over there. We would spend, uh, you know, summers pretty frequently heading over, visiting relatives, seeing Istanbul, seeing both the touristic Istanbul because you know, we were foreigners, but also the insider local Istanbul. Um, everything was in relation to like family drama and tragedy or like there was where the cabbie driver ripped us off and this is the famous mosque over here and yeah so it was all this interesting stuff um, but it it was always kind of this semi-apartness for me um, I didn't grow up speaking Turkish I kind of like had a little bit um, and I didn't grow up I grew up more interested in Turkish history than probably your average Kansas resident, um, but not like super interested. And then in about 2013, sort of this political cognizance switch occurred with the Gezi Park protests, which were this enormous uh, movement against the government. Um, and, you know, a huge amount of protests and a lot of police brutality in response. And I'm like, well, this is. This is weird. This isn't matching up with the Istanbul I know, which is all baklava and happiness and family parties. Um, so I did a lot of digging, and I kind of came to the realization, you know, that my Turkey isn't, you know, what an authentic Turkish experience is. I'm not sure of any. That's such a generalization. It doesn't exist. Uh, but mine was very different from what a lot of other people were experiencing, especially in Turks in Turkey especially under a regime that was becoming significantly more authoritarian. Um, but I grew up, you know, it was secular Turkish was kind of the big influence on me, but there's also, you know, 
very uh, religious Turkey or conservative Turkish. There was also a lot of communist Turkish uh, movements, political movements in the 70s um, up to today. It was a, it's a Turkey that is, I mean, if you can think of any group or category or amount of people or political ideology or, or religious ideology or anything like that, there's somebody like that in Turkey. And it's, it's just such a melting pot, and it has been for centuries because of the Byzantine Empire, the Romans, the Ottoman Empire. Um, it's just so much is there. Anybody could feel like they fit in. It's to an extent, um, but unfortunately, the regime is kind of trying to end that. Um, but my Turkey is one of uh, a lot of my maternal relatives are female women, um, so it's a lot of strong women in my Turkish experience, which is for the best. I think they they're very loud. They're very happy. They're very dancing. You know, a lot of a lot of drinking rukka and Turkish coffee. So. That's my circuit. I was actually going to make that question a lot harder because <laughs> in, in I in my country, you there's like one section where you list off like five things that are. And I was going to make you list off like five more. <laughs> five more. <laughs> I think it was five. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to ask one more question, and we're going to do a reading. Sure. Um, I tried to watch an interview with you that compared Istanbul to. Uh, Kansas City. I'm not from Kansas City, but I am from that side of the state. So I was really curious what the answer was, how this symbol is comparable to Kansas City. But the video just kept showing a commercial over and over and over again. <laughs> so I really honestly don't know the answer. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could tell me how this symbol is like Kansas City. Yeah. I, I'm so glad to kind of be able to answer this question again um, because, and I hope I, he'll probably never see it, but the interviewer who asked me was a little down on Kansas City. Not that I don't think it doesn't have its problems, what city doesn't, but he was like, isn't it dead? Isn't it true it's culturally dead? And I was like, well, that's a bold stance to take out of the gate. Um, but my response was kind of an interest in duality, binary, uh, geographically at least, um, is the kind of binary I'm talking about, where Kansas City has this weird like cultural cachet around which side of the state line you're on. Are you Missouri, Kansas City? Are you Kansas City, Kansas? And, you know, I don't think I've ever been to a concert or anything like that, but somebody would, you know, the band said, oh, hello, Kansas. And everybody was like, yeah, it's Missouri. Yeah, how could you possibly make that mistake ever? And I'm like, well, that's a real welcoming attitude. <laughs> Uh, but can the state line, the boundaries for Kansas City are, are relatively arbitrary. It's just a line drawn on a map, and you get a little bit of a river. Um, but in Istanbul, it's so incredibly different the way its binary operates, its, its dichotomies operate, because geographically you have the undeniableness of the Bosphorus that throat through the city, um, that incredible strait, which is absolutely gorgeous. Um, but then it has this sort of weird, you know, from the West, we like to always add the like, oh, it's where East meets West. It's where progress meets conservatism. It's where, you know, kind of radical this meets radical that. Um, it's where history meets the future. Um, and I think there's, I don't think there's a dichotomy in Istanbul couldn't fit if you didn't want it to. Um, but to me, the city is, it feels really arbitrary to have those boundaries as well. I don't think anything in Istanbul feels particularly like, oh, this is so much where the past needs to, I mean, except for, I guess, the McDonald's, the all glass McDonald's right next to the Hagia Sophia, that's pretty present meets past. Um, but it's just all there. It's all at once, all in one big experience. It doesn't feel delineated. And Kansas City felt weirdly delineated about just whether or not you're on a state line, but nothing else about that matters in Kansas City. I guess like a 1% tax, maybe, if you work on one side and live on the other. But like, other than that, you know, we all root for the Chiefs. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't think I gave a very good answer to him. I think I gave only a marginally better answer to you. Uh, but yeah, I've just always been interested in, in these sort of weird boundaries we put in places. Um, I'm always interested by borders, generally because they're drawn by empires for really weird reasons, like the Kansas-Missouri one, as a matter of slavery. 
uh, the Istanbul one as a matter of the sort of empire's entity. But yeah. Uh, I have gotten lost one time and like, wait, oh my, I actually in Kansas now, <laughs> like, uh, trying to find a good barbecue place. So they're on both sides. They so, are. I mean, <laughs> this was a very specific. But, yeah, not being from Kansas City, sure. I'm like, how did this actually happen? <laughs> like, I don't believe this. Um, all right, I'm gonna hand the mic back to you for sure. the reading. Sure. So I'll try to read. Not a lot, um, because I'm not particularly, I'm not a great voice actor. Um, but, oh, I should have used a bookmark. Got a zillion of them at home, and I'll just sit in a pile. All right, so I thought I'd read from my last story, uh, which is about a man who finds out he can talk to birds. He's a bird cage maker, and he finds out one day he can talk to birds, and this happens at about the same time that the love of his youth, when he was a child, the woman he fell in love with, uh, re-enters his life about 50 years later. Um, so I hope that's all the information we need for you. Um, and I will start. Oh, I guess I'll add just a little caveat. He's working in Galata Square, which is a square in Istanbul, and he's making bird kitchens right now. Then, from around the great base of Galata Tower, a woman stepped into the square, a basket in her arm ready to be filled with fruits from the stand down the alley, a soft scarf slung loose on the top of her head that left open her face, a face that Sami knew instantly. Eyes curved down like they were pouring coffee from dark irises, eyebrows like buttresses, lips that pouted at all times as though they were blowing steam from strong tea. Sami knew her from decades ago, before the fall of the empire, before the mess of the world, as the little girl in Dedeanch, whom he had adored. Suddenly, he became overly aware of his existence, miserable and squalored on a small crate, picking crumbs from his mustache. She took in the noise and the lights of the cafe, then glanced into the windows of the restaurant, and soon she noticed the multitude of cages hanging in the square. She took a step back and turned to leave, when suddenly Sami's bird began tweeting its melancholy tune. The woman looked around for the bird, but it was impossible to find with so many empty cages in the air. Instead, she found only Sami next to a pile of his creations. Have you done this? She asked him. I make these cages every day, Sami said, sweeping his hand across the cart of bird cages. I meant the song. Oh, said Sami. That was my little bugle. He turned toward the lowest cage in the tree and pointed at the crossbar where the bird was perched. Sami grew anxious that she had not yet recognized him, or if she did, she hid it well. Surely she must remember his bugle. Such a wonderful bird, such a cutting song. I don't know how to tell you what I mean. It sounds silly, and if you will laugh at me, thinking, poor old woman, but I was drawn to this square today. The breeze, said Sami. A sweet breeze can carry a soul anywhere. No, no, this bird, these bird cages, they must have drawn me here. I knew a man, she said, a good man and his boy who sold these capricious things. That was some time ago. Sami understands what she is trying to say. And I knew you, Fatima Han. I'm sorry, Fatima said with feeling. I haven't seen you before, but my memory... For a moment, the weight of time flashed across her face, illuminating wrinkles, sallowness, and hardened eyes. But quickly, her, feature, her features shed her age, and she was malibrial once more, elusive of erosion as the jinn are. Sami saw the slightest of smiles escape from her, one of those coy little tricks to make respectable men blush. These are beautiful cages. Could I have one? I mean, I would pay, of course, Fatima giggled to herself, with a bird in it, too. But as many birds as you like. She pressed a fingertip to her pouting lips. Better have two so they don't despair. Sami thought this intelligent forepart on her side. He told her not to worry about paying, but she insisted. So, she, so he said they would take care of it upon delivery. The bugle started up again, its body shuddering with each trip. And then she was gone. In her stead, a breeze that knocked the petals from the tree and swayed the cages into a waltz of gravity. He had met Fatima in Dediach all those years ago in an orange grove outside the village, back when he was still a young boy, maybe eight or nine. The rest of the boys from the village would parade down to Sami's house singing songs they made up on the spot. 
He hid from them upstairs, especially on days while his father was out in the hills catching birds. They would call up to the balcony, sometimes throwing stones as well, demanding Sami come out to the river or to the fields freshly plowed or to the lemon, orange, and olive groves. Sami would stay quiet and still in the corner of his room while his father only whispered to him that it was unnatural for a boy to pen himself up behind the shutters. But Sami's father had forgotten the tortures young boys could inflict upon each other. Sami would have begged his father to hide him, to lift up the floorboards and bury him there if he could speak, but he was trembling. These boys, you see, wanted Sami handed over to him for their tricks and pranks. He was that type, quiet and a bit simple, and young boys are merciless. The boys of the village started climbing the wall in that tree just outside Sami's window, some of them hanging upside down by their legs, others straddling the large branches, others still dangling by their arms and making sounds like monkeys. There's an orange grove I know of with oranges the size of your head, the chieftain of the child rebel called. Honest, Sami, I have tasted the fruit myself. Sami's father, yelling over the songs of his finches, urged Sami to go and run over the dirt paths with the other boys to take flight through the hills until his skin was dark with the dust of raucous adventuring. Sami went to the window to count the faces of the boys ready with sun. He recognized some of the older boys and thought it better to stay home, tales of their abusive games having circulated among the village children. But Sami's father, now desperate to silence the racket competing with his birds, took Sami by the shoulders, dragged him downstairs, and flung him out the front door, locking it behind him. Sami looked around the street for a place to hide, but through the walls he heard his father tell the children to come round and get him, and it wasn't long before all of them were moving through the cramped streets into the hills, a pack of bare limbs, mangy and hungry, throwing rocks at the squirrels or stray dogs. The mob of boys poured, poured down the cart path. They climbed a whiskered knoll littered with rocks that sliced their palms and feet. At the crest, they lay, belly down, across the dry and prickly glass, grass, their gazes fixed beyond into the sea of glossy green leaves of citrus trees, speckled with the globes of orange enamel in the sun. The earth beneath the canopy was shaded, dark. The sky above was a layer of blue paint so close you could scrape chips of it off with your fingertips. In the breeze, the trees shimmered like salmon scales. On the wind, the bite of citrus. Go on, said one of the boys. Why me? Because you spend so much time with the birds, you must know something of flight. Because your mother was Greek. Because you smell like vinegar. They told Sami that because he was the shortest, the lightest, he would have to go up first and spot for the watchman. In those days, the lords hired watchmen for their groves and orchard. There were issues of brigands and thievery en masse that preceded war. Sami protested, but the other boys grabbed him by his limbs, hoisted him off the ground, and carried him down into the grove, shouting that they'd ram him into a tree if he didn't climb up at once. They're too tall, he shouted. They were only ten meters each, but a meter is great if you were an ant. The children on his legs held firm despite his writhing. The four captors started running for the trunk of the nearest tree, aiming to cleave Sami in two with dull force. All right, he cried. All right, all right, I will climb. Put me down. So they stuck him up the tree and urged him up through the bundle of branch and fruit and leaf and sap, half with cheers, half with threats, until the offshoots creaked with his weight, and their limbs were th and the limbs were thinner than his own frame, and he swayed to and fro with the squirrels. Some of the boys had climbed up after him, already work at plucking oranges and releasing them into the waiting nets of outstretched shirts below. What do you see up there? Sami didn't know any words that meant something so encompassing as all of an orange grove, all of a hillside, all of an empire, the complete bond with the earth, but also with the sky. Nothing, he said. The boys made him stay posted while they gorged, their tanned bellies growing bulbous until they looked like roasted meats on spits. Some of the boys napped in the shade. The oldest boy, the self-appointed bay of daytime orphans, followed yellow and black butterflies in weaves through the trunks. Around him lay orange rinds splayed open, sticky shells, sh sticky shells of a feast picked clean. Sami watched the boy as he waited for the butterflies to land. He would catch them and stick their slender legs in sap to watch them struggle. When he tired of listening for the noises they made, he pinched their gossamer wings between his fingers and tore them off. Some other boys took interest and joined him in catching the butterflies by their velvety bodies and de-winging them, perhaps all of them using the wings to make wishes by. Over the crown of trees, Sami saw a dust cloud fast approaching, too near to tell the boys to run off, too near to climb down himself and escape. Guards, he shouted to the boys, they're riding this way. 
There's no time. What will we do? We'll kill you, Sami, for this. Hi. And in the frenzy of tawny bodies scrambling for cover, no one could hear Sami ask, What about me? Help me down. I can't make it. No one noticed except, of course, the oldest, who, from his hiding place in a patch of tall grass, shouted at Sami, Keep still. Please let me down. The cloud of dust billowed closer, and the sound of clopping hooves rushed toward them. The oldest lay flat in the grass and pulled the leaves over himself. Some climbed up into the branches. Others stood like idiots behind the thick trunks. No, none thought to hide the orange fields. The tree trembled with Sami as he watched for the procession of guards in brilliant white turbans and crimson fezes, as he thought of calling down to them upon their arrival to help them out of the tree. But what would befall him then? Yet there were no guards on the horizon, no flowing green robes or banners of the local bay. Instead, down the path that cut through the grove rode a figure like porcelain atop a horse as black as the hopes of lepers. From the heavy hooves rose a plumage of dust, white to match the robes and salvar worn by the rider. Sami froze in his perch, eyes losing sight of all things but this rider as she neared. Her face like an oleander behind a sheer veil, her hair dark and long, falling to the horse's mane and mingling indistinguishably. She looked small on the horse, but not frail. Her head was only partially covered. She looked a few years older than any of the boys, but she was still young. And you could see the, and you could see that she would stay that way. The horse stopped a few trees from Sami's and pushed its nose across the dry grass and orange fields. The girl, without huff, gracefully drew her own sword. Who's been stealing from me? She shouted. Who's been eating what is mine? We're terribly sorry, said Sami, almost choking with regret for making a sound. But all the other boys, unworried by a girl, fascinated by the blade, curious about the horse, had already begun emerging from their hiding places, shaking off dirt and leaves and grit. Stay back, said the girl. I'll spill your blood with this. And who are you to give commands, the oldest boy asked. The horse grunted as if to answer for its master, but she needed no tongue other than her own. I am Fatima, she pronounced, daughter of Metin Effendi, who owns this grove and the land around it, you dogs dare trespass. She sounded like the men twice her height and thrice her age that Sami's father haggled with in the bazaars. Be careful not to hurt yourself, called Sami, eyes on her blade and wanting to say something. Who's talking? That's no one, said the oldest. Just the son of a bird peddler stuck in a tree, said another. And so he behaves like a bird, asked Fatima. And all the boys began claiming Sami thought he could fly, thought that his father's birds had taught him, that he had water in his brains and spent too much time with finches and larks. In truth, heights made Sami dizzy. If he cannot fly, then how did he get so high? asked Fatima. That's no great distance, said a scrawny boy. I could throw a stone up there. I could hit him with a rock from here. Maybe you couldn't, said the oldest, but I could and erupted the competition of hitting Sami with rocks in order to impress the girl on horseback. <laughs> the branches were dense with foliage. Fewer rocks snuck through than Sami expected. He was bruised only in a, in a few places. And anyway, he didn't blame the boys. He would have done the same thing and more to impress Fatima. Stop at once, said Fatima, swatting at the tops of their heads with, her flat, with the flat of her blade. Get him down from there. Get him yourself, said the oldest. And though Sami thought she might, Hoped she would climb up to him and ask him about birds. She instead turned her horse around and told the rabble to leave. Told them that if they wanted to live, they should go now before her father's servants arrived to lop their heads off. Reluctantly, the band of village boys broke rank and retreated down the hills for their homes. Fatima looked up into the tree and smiled her first smile. It was clumsy and filled up Satima's throat and filled up Sami's throat with a giggle. Is your father truly the bird peddler? Oh, yes. If you come to him, I will make sure he gives you anything you desire for nothing in return. Can you make it down? Sami nodded. Hurry down, she said impatiently. The servants are looking for me and will surely check here. For though it was her father's groves and her steed, she was out without permission, skipping another of her dozens of lessons and teachings arranged by Metin Effendi to prepare her for courtly life. Sure enough, in the distance came the faint call of a few of her father's servants, shouting her name genially, glad to be walking the groves on such a beautiful day instead of teaching her etiquette and manners. She rode off, the dust dissolving her image, the insides of Sami's chest fluttered with butterflies, 
and he wondered if the boys could reach through his ribs, would they tear off these wings of his heart as one? And I'll stop there. I have time for one or two more questions while you all think of your questions for the audience Q&A. Um, so almost all of your stories have magic or fantastical elements. Why did you choose to incorporate magic into real world settings and events and specifically like, kind of Turkish? Like how important is that to these stories? Um, so it all kind of started with my growing interest in reading Turkish literature and, and the sort of history of oral storytelling, the tradition uh, of oral storytelling in Turkey um, through like copy houses and stuff, all the way back to uh, Shahrazad and the Thousand and One Nights. Um, but in tandem with sort of this interest in the Turkish fable tradition um, and then reading kind of contemporary uh, Turkish epics and things like that. Um, I also got really interested in kind of magical realism in the States written as a way to kind of address things that just feel so odd, but are so incredibly real, you know? And so for example, in Turkey, kind of the rise of authoritarianism and, and sort of the just absurd lengths the current regime will go to to maintain it, whether it's jailing a journalist for making a mean comparison between the president and the character Gollum from Lord of the Rings, um, or asking Germany to jail a comedian for making fun of him in Germany. Um, you know, the, this is a really thin-skinned guy, uh, but it has real-world repercussions for many people. I mean, Turkey jails more journalists than just about anywhere else. Um, and one year recently, I think it was uh, 2016 or 2019, they had the most journalists in jail. Uh, it was something like 230 in one year, um, which is just outlandish. Um, and you look at the way Kurds are treated, the way other minorities are treated, um, different kind of lifestyles are treated, um, or, or you know, people for who they are, the way they're treated. It's just so weird. And you could write, I mean, many people do very successfully write very real things in response to this. But that always feels a little bit too much like journalism to me. Um, and even though these are incredibly horrendous topics or heavy topics or, or heartbreaking things, literature always needs to have a little bit of fun, in my opinion. It needs to feel a little bit more like play instead of work. Otherwise, I won't do it uh, because I don't like working. <laughs> so magic has always kind of been a way for me to, if I can't, kind of convince a reader to know what it's like to be Turkish during a lot of this stuff. I can at least use the magic of some of these stories to convince them about the sparkling glitteringness of Istanbul in my imagination. And we can bridge that gap of not knowing by having that sort of commonality that is the fable. Um, I hope I answered that. <laughs> Uh, my last question is where I admit that I stalked you a little bit. Um, just a tiny bit, not sure, a lot. Sure. Um, but on your Instagram, you have incredible recommendations of books, several of which we overlap with, uh, wow. which is fantastic. Um, uh, Frankenstein in Baghdad, uh, Three Floors Up. Ooh, that's um, yeah, I noticed that you like, were like, raving about other press. So I'm wondering, for the world literature lover, what else you might recommend right now? Um, I will always recommend Italo Calvino, if, if you know me. So that's a really boring answer. Um, so definitely, uh, Jose Saramago is, I think, I mean, my editor would get on my case. She'd be like, how are you reading too many dead people? <laughs> what can you tell but I'm like, he just recently died. It's not that. They don't ask for blurbs. So. That's true. Yeah, that's what it is. Uh, but no, Jose Saramago is one I'm currently reading uh, right now and absolutely loving. But Elena Ferrante is, I, I mean, she's such a household name. It feels silly recommending. Um, but really, truly, any of the Italians, I read Domenico Starnone, Dino Buzzati, um, Tommaso Landolfi, they're fantastic. Any Eastern European kind of Balkan, uh, Czech area, they're great at like humor through authoritarianism. Um, highly recommend. Marco, 
no, Yoko Ogawa, uh, who did Memory Police, is fantastic. That's such a great book. I highly recommend it. Um, in that same vein, uh, Once and Forever, out of New York Review of Books, I'm blanking on the author's name. He's from Japan. Um, it's his fairy tales that he wrote, kind of for adults, but also for children. Uh, fantastic. I love fairy tales. Love a good fairy tale. Uh, but you can get kind of a global feel here in the States, too, with authors like uh, Papachi Bujak, Aisha Papachi Bujak, uh, who did the Trojan War Museum, and then uh, uh, Raj Parmaswaran is fantastic. I am an executioner. Uh, love stories is the kind of underline. It's so good. It, like, it hurts, so and it's like so silly. I've never like almost cried at a, like a story about an insect on an alien planet. <laughs> I and I did them. <laughs> it's fantastic. I chose that as a Valentine's recommendation one year. <laughs> I don't know about what year it is about. And they're all it's, about love. It's about like, love, yeah. <laughs> not healthy, I don't think. <laughs> but no, I'd start there and, and work my way around the world. Uh, I want to ask one more question. <laughs> so. Um, do you mind if we get a little gossiping? Uh, I can't, I, yeah, I, but I gossip a lot, so okay. I might be opening up a can of worms. All right, so I don't know if you all have been following the book news, but Elizabeth Gilbert wrote a novel about Russia, was announced, 500 people got really angry on uh, Goodreads and gave a one-star review. She is no longer going to be publishing her next novel next year. Uh, it is postponed indefinitely. Um, but since you also kind of write about authoritarian states, what are your feelings on any of it? I mean, there have been people, I follow Rebecca Mackay on a lot of things, who is very angry that she pulled the book, and other people are saying, like, oh, like for Ukraine, she should have pulled the book. Um, so I'm curious what you might have opinions about as a writer. Um. So I only know about this because I'm in a Slack group chat that loves to gossip. And I kind of am on the periphery because I'm a horrible <laughs> literary citizen. I don't know any of the high gossip, but I love to partake. Um, and we had an over-under on when it would be postponed to. Um, and I was I was like, well, Arrested Development made a 9-11 joke in 2003. So it's probably just going to be two years from the start of the war, the invasion, Russian invasion of Ukraine. So we'll see if I'm right. I'm taking a guess. Um, but she sort of willingly decided to pull the book, from what I can understand, when the Ukrainians complained that it was a book about Russia set in Russia. Um, but from also what I could understand, it was critical of the Soviet, Soviet Russian leadership, and it was kind of an exploration of people who wanted to leave the Soviet state while being stuck in Russia. Um, so that's sort of a weird book to advocate polling, considering there are so many overlaps between Putin and the, the Soviet regime. Um, so I, I hesitate to say anything only because I'm being recorded. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say I am always in favor of you know, allowing any book to be published. I'm always in favor uh, of writing, especially when people tell you not to write something. Um, I, in like a kind of sick, twisted relationship with Turkey, I kind of hope that this book does well enough that it gets known over there and banned. Because um, there's no way that it's like just open, welcome it with open arms. Um, but it's it's an unfortunate reality a lot of authors face, especially around the globe. Um, you know, how do you how do you hide what you're trying to say so it gets past the censor, or do you just take on the censor and risk jail time? I'm in an incredibly privileged position. No one's going to throw me in jail for this book as long as I'm here. Um, so I take advantage of it where I can because I know other authors aren't so lucky, especially in Turkey. Um, but I, I never advocate for calling for someone to pull a book. Okay. It is time for your questions. So I have the microphone. If you want to raise your hand so that the virtual audience can hear you ask your question. <laughs> I'll just get more gossipy if you make me ask questions. <laughs> so. so you you write about Turkey now, and uh, did you always have that as your centerpiece? And do you look to write about different things in different places in the future? Um, I didn't always write about Turkey. At 
at first I wrote really bad Hemingway impersonation uh, stories. I was doing a lot of boxers in seedy places and throughout the world, um, generally not in Europe. So I guess it was a little different than Hemingway. Um, and I wrote a story I think I'm pretty proud of about the volcanic explosion in Yellowstone that kind of covered a lot of the U.S. with ash uh, for months in the 80s. Uh, I wasn't alive in the 80s, so I don't know if that's true. If you were, tell me if you could see the ash. Um, although I wouldn't be surprised with, with New York and all that lately. Um, and though I'm currently working on a novel set in Turkey, I would be really interested. I find myself getting drawn more and more to kind of historic literary fiction set throughout, like Portugal, Spain, Italy, uh, Morocco, uh, Algeria, old ex Ottoman Empire, Balkans. Um, but I. I don't know if I would ever write about the states. Um, I don't know. <laughs> There's something about being too close to a thing for me as a writer. I really love to discover as I'm writing, and and you know that old adage, write what you know. I think that's a lot of hooey. Uh, I think you should go know something and then write, not because if you only write very insularly, you're just going to write the same story over and over again. You're going to write about what it's like to be on a college campus and hang out with <laughs> other liberal arts majors um, over and over again. And you know, that might work, I guess, for some people, but I would be so bored. Our writers are really boring. So if you only write what you know, it's gonna be a lot of looking out windows, looking at your hands, looking at the keyboard, <laughs> gotta walk the dog, you know, um, pretty boring stuff. So I try to like, like I learned a whole lot about mining for the Soma story. I forgot it all almost immediately. <laughs> and then when my copy editor was like fact checking, they're like, is this how mine works? And I was like, must have been. <laughs> but I don't know now. <laughs> but uh, no, I always I always want to write about experiences that can feel very far away and trying to find that human, that small human thing that connects us all. That's my way in. Uh, because I think we're all a lot more related, a lot. A lot more, a lot more similar than we realize. Um, I think geographic distances can trick us. That's why I highly recommend travel too. So to pick up with that kind of latest comment, uh, what is the research process uh, involved in real world locations, but then also? with any sort of historical events to it, like what kind of research goes into crafting those stories, making sure that they're authentic. Uh, that's a great question because of, I would say, how much value is put on authenticity? Um, probably always, but it feels pertinent now. I feel like, you know, is this authentic enough? Um, am I doing due diligence? Um, and I do worry about that a lot, and that's why I spend a lot of time doing nonfiction reads. Like I'll read books and books about Turkish history, Ottoman Empire history, just to get, you know, just a slight bit of information about which province had a lot more sheep than another province, so that I write it correctly for my story. But you can go too far, um, and you can. It's. I found that research has been a really great way for me to avoid writing when it feels like work. <laughs> Um, and when it no longer feels like play, I'm like, well, I'll just do a little more research. Uh, but beyond that, um, I'd probably get a lot of flack from my high school teachers, but Wikipedia is incredible. Um, there's so much. That and Google Maps, I mean, between the two, you can go almost anywhere, like, just to see it and understand a little bit of it. It's a little, it's obviously very different to experience being someone else. Um, but you can get at least, you know, directional things correct. Um, I've lost my train of thought because of this. <laughs> 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 uh, I've never seen him pay more attention like to someone reading a story than he did to you. I think it was all the oranges. <laughs> 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 Might have been the birds. <laughs> 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 yeah, all the birds. <laughs> so, in this collection specifically, which of the characters was most exciting to kind of write and see develop through the story? Um, I think at the time of writing, 
because I do a lot of drafts. Sorry, Kat. I do a lot of drafts. Um, so first draft, second draft, third draft, fourth, before it's ever even in a place where I share it with anybody. Um, but I think first draft having the most fun was the Bird Keeper's Moral uh, Sami, just because I put a lot of who I thought I was as a child into his youth. Um, and as an old man, I mean, he's 50-ish at the end of the story, and he's still kind of bumbling around and talking to birds and just forgetting to eat his lunch and having a sandwich and lounging around in the sun and having all these fantasies. Um, I could see myself doing that at 50 as well. Um, so, especially talking to birds who aren't talking back, like Sami. Um, but it's, I think, between him and then there's a story in here called Three Parts in which Henry uh, kills his daughters about a man who has three um, you know, 19, 21, 23 year old daughters. Um, and he instead is just reading fairy tale after fairy tale and never interacts with them and keeps confusing them. And they're all just this bickering after his attention while he continues to read fairy tales. And I think, um, I don't think I'm ever gonna have that problem. I, I am not that addicted to reading fairy tales. Um, but in creating him as a character and kind of what I find magical about literature and what I find so enticing about the escapism of literature, um, it was fun to play with him and see a character who, despite all of this development, doesn't actually change um, and stays kind of not good <laughs> through no fault of his own. I think one more question. I'll, I'll ask. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so while you were doing your reading, um, I personally made some um, connections to The Bear in the Trees, which I know is one of your favorite books. I'm his wife, so it's not weird. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> we're both admitting a story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I particularly saw connections in um, Sami and Fatima's relationship that I connect back to uh, Bear in the Trees. So I was wondering how often you find yourself taking inspiration from things that you've read, and if it's something you do intentionally, or if it's kind of subconscious. This is um, really fun for me, uh, because I have to like badger my wife to talk to me about my work. Um, so now that she's like, having to do it publicly, she's scoring a lot of points. That's <laughs> Not that she's not supportive, that's not what I mean. <laughs> uh, I'm just not a good enough writer for her. That's the, uh, but it's it's something that is kind of always fearfully in the back of my mind. I know I'm an incredibly easily influenced person, which is why I can't like doom scroll either. It takes like five minutes. I'm like, well, the world's ending, and I'm in a bad mood. So I actually curate books that I keep near me and read, and I have to be very careful about whatever I'm reading while I'm working on a project. And for the novel-length thing, that's been horrible. Um, and I've actually tried to avoid reading anything even remotely related to the novel. Um, but I do actively keep about 20 books, um, Baron in the Trees is one of them, on a book stack near my desk um, that I can always kind of go to. Not when I am like, what should I do next? What did Calvina do? And I'll just copy it. More just because I trust in the, in the masters that I see to kind of guide me subconsciously to reach my own conclusions and, and to kind of grow from that. Um, but I do have to be careful. <laughs> it's, it's, easy to, it's easy to kind of plant really good seeds of literature in your mind um, when you're reading such great books. But, any book that makes me want to go sit down and write is a fantastic book, and that's what I look for. That, and if it's fun. If I if it feels like the author had fun while writing it, or I'm having fun reading it, and it makes me want to write, those are my two metrics for whether or not it's a good book. And I'm not very old, but I'm too old to waste time on books that aren't good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's have another break. So we're going to do the signing up here. We do have books available for sale at the desk. Um, I'm going to predict that this is going to be an award winner, so you're going to want to have a signed copy. Um, but I want to thank you all so much for coming out tonight and for joining us, uh, for being such a fantastic crowd with incredible questions. So thank you so much for being here.